Hello, everybody. Here I am with the famous Ben Johnson of the Perpetual Chess Podcast. And what we are going to be doing is we are going to be giving him a tour of the Chess Dojo training program. And I'm really pumped to get his uh, take on the program, maybe even some constructive criticism. And then later, we're going to do a podcast where we talk about what it would take to make 2200 using his personal story, just what his, you know, he talks to a lot of people who are into chess improvement. I'm sure he has some ideas. And so one of the things we'll spend some time on this show is looking at his cohort, which would be, I think, the 2000 to 2100. Now, why 2000 to 2100? Because that's the FIDE estimator, which we're now looking at here. Oh, you're hitting me where it hurts, Jesse. You know, I used to be over 2,200 feet. <laughs> every tournament, I play a new unrated 12-year-old and just hemorrhage feet day points. But yeah. anyway, hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So here, let me first say that I want to give credit. One of the cool things about our training program is we have a lot of people who are tech savvy. And, you know, it's not me. It's not me doing the tech. But... We had a problem right at the beginning is we, need a, we needed a universal uh, rating system. And so we're using the FIDE rating. But as you can see, like there, you scroll down a little bit, there's no FIDE rating for like a 400 player, right? So we had to construct a um, system to make it universal. And then, like I said, we have some tech savvy people. We had this rating estimator which is really cool. So imagine, let's say you play on chess.com and USCF. Those are your, where you're active. Then you could put in two values right there and it'll weigh both of those things equally. Or maybe you have all three. Then you could put in all three and then it'll weigh all three equally. Um, <clears throat> and of course, like the Lee chess is wrapped, you know, monstrously inflated, but that, you know, this rating estimator will adjust for that. And does this, so this is for classical and rapid, right? Does it do blitz or no? This, right. We are just classical. Okay. Um, and I'll say, I'll say that one of the key tenets of our program is that even if you wanted to be good at blitz, our belief is that you need to uh, do system two thinking, which is long classical chess. Also, uh, training that is not just some quick stuff, but is really kind of engaging your mind on a deeper level. So, right, this is all classical rated okay. stuff. Yeah, I see. And as we discussed in Maryland, part of the, one of the reasons I was, obviously I'm a huge dojo fan, you guys do amazing stuff, but part of the reason I haven't joined um, the cohorts and was a bit hesitant is I just, um, I just basically don't play online slower than five minute. Um, Right. Uh, every time I play, uh, try to play a training game, just can't take it seriously, and I try to play tournaments enough to counteract that. And then blitz is a way to work on my openings a bit. Sure. Right. I, I, I'm totally with you. In fact, I'll show you something kind of interesting. So I'm going to now move to the scoreboard here. And um, when you look at... At, let's say I just randomly, I'm on the 1800 to 1900 cohort. So for USCF, that's roughly 1900 to 2000, right? And you look at, look at this. First of all, an amazing cohort. We got 33 people in here. And if you look at the rating system, they get to choose their rating system. And one of the remarkable things is as you move up the rating bands, more and more people are listing over the board ratings, such yeah. as USCF and FIDE. So for example, here you get a mix, maybe 30% of each of those um, rating systems. And then we go here, and then you can see only a couple people are using online ratings for 1900, That's 2000. Interesting, yeah. And then if we go up again, and I assume this would be your cohort, there's our friend James Altucher. Shout um, out to James. Then you see that really we're just talking USCF and FIDE. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. So um, I think uh, many people have joined the dojo just to get longer games online. Um, and that's cool. But, but right, that's not, I don't think that's the main reason to join. You know, that's not the main reason to do it. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. 
Um, I do. I have to tell you, Jesse, I do need motivation. I mean, I told you I am getting lessons and I, but my motivation waxes and wanes and it's uh -huh. definitely at an ebb right now. So. Uh huh. Okay. Um, then stuff like this controversy doesn't help. How am I supposed to sit there and study it? Study chess, you know, there's <laughs> content to be consumed. That's right. Well, okay, let me say a couple things about it. First, I want to say part of the idea, part of the reason people are coming us to us for longer games, just because we're on the subject of cheating, is it's not like playing in the dojo is going to prevent cheating entirely. But you are going to be amongst a demographic in the dojo that is just far less inclined to cheating. Yeah. Because these people are all have paid a nominal fee and are engaged in the work that is meant to make them better and so it's it's not the kind of people who are going to be cheating i'm sure it'll still nevertheless happen at some level but still right it's not the demographic yeah so okay next why don't we show you some things here so this is 202100 and i'll just scroll over here and Let's talk motivation for a second, because I'm in the same boat with you. Um, one thing I've seen as a teacher that this is really cool for is, I, you know, with my students, I generally just go over games. That's, that's been my teaching philosophy for years. But then with all the stuff on the side of the games and the game analysis, it's hard for me to pin the student down. And a lot of times, it's like the student will leave it up to themselves to do whatever they think is important on the side, right? And that's why having the structure is so cool because instead of it being like, oh, maybe you should do some problems, or oh, maybe you should do this, it's like, no, it's set in stone what you need to do, and we're gonna go over the games. And not only that, but when we go over the games, here, I'm gonna scroll over here. When we go over the games, you are then going to make a click mark here for the games that you've gone over, right? You make a little check. That's so that, cool. that will give you a sense of um, your progress. And then, of course, you're in a cohort, so they can see what you've done and you can see what they've done. I should also say some of these people in here are notoriously bad, like, like the famous James Howell teacher. <laughs> Me and him have gone over many of his games. He's pretty good at going over his games. So he's well into it over here, well into it with the checking off of the boxes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so why don't we start here and let's do this. Let's just go through these things and I'll show you what the requirements are of your cohort and then we can kind of bounce around and look at whatever it is that you know uh, whatever your interest is in looking at is so first thing is have you ever done the polgar maiden tubes uh not to completion yeah i've i've done some of them so i really i i'm the one i'm the jerk who forced this on, <laughs> on everybody um but uh this is a book I've done several times. I did a I did it again, did a YouTube video about it. I think it's really cool. And then shout out to Figius, who's a guy helping us here. He did this progress bar that's really cool mm -hmm. for how many of the problems you've done. Okay. And then we uh, we succumbed to popular demand, which I don't think is a bad thing, and we included the puzzle rush. That's what this is here. Oh, okay. Both with the five minute and then the survival score. Have you been addicted to that thing? Very briefly when it came out, but yeah. it was, um, yeah, I moved on. <laughs> Fair enough. Have you ever read this book, The Woodpecker Method? Oh, yeah, yeah. Did okay. a podcast about it with Neil Bruce. Cool, cool. So every, um, every cohort has several books. Usually one is a tactics book. And so for this cohort, it's The Woodpecker Method. Okay. Yeah, solid, solid choice. And then uh, David Proust set us up with middle game sparring positions. And um, I'll show you how we would, you would get the sparring, how you'd find a partner to do that in a second. But basically what you have to do <clears throat> is do well in a, 
depending on the, you know, there's different requirements in a particular sparring position against someone in your cohort, not just some random person, but somebody in your cohort to get the check marks, right? Oftentimes it's a position, you know, that's winning and you have to like win it a certain amount of times. And so you're just thrown into a position, right? And then you have to kind of think about it deeply. Um, uh, and you and only do those against um, against another person, not, or can you do them against an engine? No, just against another person, right? Okay. Uh, and all of the sparring, one of the cool things that we have going on here is all of the sparring is done in your cohort because the idea is that you are measuring yourself against people who are really around your same level, right? Um, actually, I'll say one of the tenets of the program I stole from James Altucher where he had this idea of the plus minus equal, right? That you have somebody above you who's, you whose advice you're following, who you kind of bow down to a little bit. Then you have a cohort with whom you work and spar with, argue with. And then you have uh, people below you who you try to articulate your thoughts to. Right? So that's yeah. part of that's part of the whole dojo setup, and I will sh I'll show you a couple more of that. Then we have the book Endgame Strategy. You read that one? Oh yeah, I did yeah. a part about that too. Another classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great. Uh, yeah, so to, I feel pretty good about those two books in this cohort section. Now here we have three endgame sparring positions. Those are like let's say positional endgames. Um, and a lot of we've done a lot of those on our, our Endgame Sensei show here on Twitch. And then we have algorithms. Um, I think this might be Rook and Bishop versus Rook, for example. And then the coolest thing, I think it's the coolest thing anyway. Uh, I did this thing, REP stands for the Rook Endgame Progression. And oh, so, so, you know, I think a lot of people try to learn rook end games by like memorizing certain positions and it's not a bad start but honestly rook end games especially you know they're hard <laughs> they are very hard and so <clears throat> what i did is i created um a, a long set of rook end games that people should be familiar with many of which are all super hard um but the key I realized, my idea was, is that for the Rook endgame progression, what's important is not that you memorize a position, like you get some position and then you have to prove, prove it against an engine or something, but that you prove it against somebody who is at your level, right? So imagine this, somebody in a lower cohort, the 1900-2000, completed the Rook endgame progression in that cohort. Then when they came up a level, there would be more positions and they would have to win it against somebody who's a little bit stronger. Uh, that's right? a good idea. So these, all these matches, you only get a check mark if you won the match, right? Um, and my experience as a teacher is like, those positions have a lot of practical skill, even if they are um, an objective level like technical, like objectively winning or something like that. There's usually a lot of different variations and the defender can be very tricky, you know? And sometimes it even ends in a queen versus rook endgame, right? And then you gotta win that too. Okay, moving on. Tall Bob Vinnick, 1960, you've read that one. No, no, you got me there. I, I uh, read its uh, predecessor, but Tall's Life and Games, but- You kidding I, me, boss? You haven't know, read it, right? this one? Shameful. And I need some talk. You know, I'm one of those people who doesn't have enough spice in his game. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I need some talk. <laughs> okay. I think um, we did a podcast ages ago about what we felt like the best chess books of all time were. And we put this at the top. I think I feel pretty confident about that uh, verdict, too. That that's the best chess book of all time. Wow. So, so interesting that you haven't done that. That's, that should be on your show. That should yeah, be on your show. You it will sometime that. for sure. With often, especially with books like that, glaring omissions in what I've read. It's like yeah. I'll, I'll schedule a podcast about it just so I make sure I read it. <laughs> 
How about Road to Chess Improvement? Have you read that one? Yeah, did a pod about that, read that uh-huh. twice. Classic. Cool. Cool. Out, was awesome. Now, uh, then the other thing that we got going on are these classic games. Now, this is a little bit misleading because there are far more classic games for this cohort than um, are on here. And for example, so the way the classic games work is they are unannotated games of champions. So for example, 202100 is all about Karpov, right? And so um, there's a variety of ways to go over these games. Of course, you can do it by yourself on a board. But what a lot of people have done is they've got together on our Discord server and then um, talked about uh, the game with a bunch of other people, like analyzed it together with their cohort members. And that's a pretty cool thing. <clears throat> And um, what I've, I've really been, so for example, in the 2400 plus thing, it's the Carlson games that we're going over. It's, it's amazing. And it's so interesting to go over games that don't have any, you know, take away any annotations. And then I picked, I was the one who did the databases. I chose not like the fancy games, right? The like, who's got the best games. I chose the games where like they were playing against the best of their generation. You know, and the key, like the key big games that they have. And it's tough. <laughs> There's some yeah. really tough games. Um, so, Ben, I asked on Discord this morning what I should show you. And one of the people said, look, there is a, a some YouTube clips that, that our, a guy named Revolver Jack has been doing. And so they told me to just show you some. And so I picked it. I haven't even watched it yet. So I'll just figure we'll, we'll go over briefly and check it out. We'll come back to the scoreboard. Here we go. Okay, cool. So this is uh, in, a, in a cohort where they're just going over Capablanca games. And you can see he's, here he's got game eight going on. All right, let's listen in for a little bit and see how they do. Okay. Grab a pawn. Grab what pawn? Well, you'd have... I, I don't think... You can't play bishop takes b7... Because uh, the night take L. Yeah, yeah, I just I just saw it. Yeah, you can't hang. Yeah, you'd hang right there. They're figuring it out. <laughs> I, I think you're actually a little better at swipe it because sure it's black rat. It's got to move. You've got to move the ropes. You're going to end up losing that bishop. Yeah. I'm probably just side of the shirk. Yeah, so they're slowly coming to realize that black is better in this variation. You can see they got the mega tree that they're working on. Yeah, right? that's nice. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that is one of the best things that we've got going on is that, you know, and, and we didn't, I, like, I encourage people to do that, but I, it's not like we organized it. They went to their own, you know, in the Discord got it together, then, you know, have done it. And most of them aren't recording it, so it's kind of cool just for me to have an example to show you where people are working together, you know, in that same group that, you know, they're also going to end up playing a lot of uh, games with and also sparring various things out, like the end games. And then also here you can see they've got opening positions to spar. Um I should mention though here we have we have everybody memorize a game. It's kind of a rough requirement, sometimes <laughs> harder than others. And um, four move checkmate. <clears throat> four move checkmate. Well, you know, for the lower, the very lowest cohorts, we made them very short games. Yeah. And we, and they, oh, it's specific games. You don't get to pick. Right. No specific games. Okay. That's right. And then here, I know a lot more work has been done than shown on the scoreboard. But like James, for example. That worthless dude. <laughs> he hasn't put up. He hasn't put up. Listen, he, he's too busy studying chess. He can't be bothered with his picture. <laughs> Anyways, this is a cool thing. Um, we need we need sparring spelled correctly, right? Um, <laughs> um, but this is a really cool thing where um, it, we so we created these dojo repertoires that people don't have to follow, but 
we created these repertoires and instead of it being like memory based, right? Like, you know, memorize a bunch of stuff chessable style. We have certain key positions that we marked as sparring positions, right? And so then in these sparring positions, they have to go to people in their cohort and spar them out, right? Key positions from their, um, from their opening repertoire to get a sense of it and then maybe talk a little bit about it after they finish. And they don't have to finish the whole game. They just need to finish, like, come out of the opening, right? After it's clear that the opening is over and then discuss it and then rinse and repeat. And then, of course, they have to play out positions of openings that they're not familiar with, right? Because yeah. their, other, their other cohort members will have opening repertoires that are different than their own. Um, so that's a really cool thing that is developing. And me and Kostya have been slow <laughs> to put up like immense amount of repertoires, but that is happening, you know? And I, the dream is kind of like that, sure, everybody's gonna be playing different opening systems, but if we get a, let's say, a strong majority of people playing dojo opening repertoires, then there'll be kind of an institutional knowledge built up around uh, different openings. Hmm. So King's Indian. <laughs> Kostya's doing the King's Indian, right? Yeah. And James Altucher's doing the King's Indian. My other students, a couple other students of mine are playing the King's Indian. That's right. Um, okay. And then we keep moving. Then we got model games. That's like games of, from the openings. Um, we want people to do model games. Not, not just like super GM games, but also... Games from the cohort, which is also really cool. We have our own cohort database of games. Yeah. Um, and I can talk to you a little bit more about that in a second, too. So here we go. So um, comment on someone else's analysis. Review game with a higher player. That's a little bit of the plus minus. Um, and then we have the classical games and postmortems. Uh, one thing, actually, I want to say, that one of the coolest things about the program that... Um, I was surprised by is you, first of all people have you know we got submit the PGN text here in the database up here and a lot of people have done it and I've covered a lot of those games on stream and one of the amazing things that happened is that people have been actually very diligent about not using the computer and expressing their ideas in human form like this is what I think was going on uh, to a remarkable degree, I mean, people rated 800, 900, having very, you know, clear thoughts about their games. Um, and that's, that was my dream. That was my dream. And one of the interesting things about it is before the program came along, I was having a lot of trouble as a teacher uh, getting my students to be very diligent in their annotations. A lot of times they'd show up to the lesson and they hadn't done the work or it was just kind of sloppy. But the dream here was like the act, or the idea, the, the, the fact that you're gonna have to publish it, right? Even if not that many people are gonna see it, the fact that you are gonna publish it means that you're gonna take a little bit more care, maybe even a lot more care, in articulating your thoughts. And that process of articulating the thoughts is really where I think the growth comes and yeah, it's, it's been amazing. It's, I, I, like I figured I'd go through that database and we'd have one or two games that were well annotated. No, like every time I'm clicking, I'm saying, oh, someone did some real work. That's you know, cool. Some real work. Okay, so let me ask you an intuitive question. Just looking at this, look at this. A ma this, this, by the way, is the biggest feature of every cohort is the classical games and the, the analysis. Um, looking over this just intuitively, do you have a sense of like something else that would want to be there for you to make 2200? Again, let me just clarify. So 2200, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about Ben making 2200 USCF and 2100 FIDE, which is here, is about the same as 2200 USCF. I can't even, honestly, I can't even set a goal FIDE. FIDE is like a, a untamed beast in uh in the U.S. right now, um, <laughs> but but 2200 USCF is a good goal. Right. Like I've been losing FIDE while I gain a little USCF, although I just had a bad tournament. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yeah, I mean, as Evan, I think said in chat, I mean, it's all about peer pressure. Like that's, that's the only thing I need, <laughs> you know, what, what I'm doing is, is secondary. If, uh, if I feel like I'm held accountable and actually, uh, putting the time in. Yeah, absolutely. Peer pressure is really interesting. Um, here, let me show you here. Here's a fun thing. By the way, up here, you can see what the graduations are. So 2,200 feet at USCF is truly the top of this um, cohort. Um, then you can see this is average rating gain per cohort member. Um, and then something that we're, we're almost done with, I'm going to show you it in the lower cohorts, is we're getting average rating gain per box clicked. Right, which is amazing because then it gives you the uh, ability to say, okay, if I do this work, if I click this box, I'm going to get roughly this amount of rating gain. That's great. I love it. Yeah. That's very Greg Shahadi. He likes those little micro rewards. <laughs> right, right. Um, actually, why don't I just jump into one of these? I'll just jump into, let's say, uh, 1,200, 1,300. And you can see here, look at this. Look how big this group is, man. We had 72 people here. I think overall our numbers are something like we're maybe 850 total people in the program. Um, and here we have uh, per box clicked, three points per box clicked. And it changes every day, you know, because people's ratings are changing and they're clicking different boxes. If we go 1,300, 1,400, we have 11 points per box clicked. And then once, of course, we do the whole... Uh, the whole, uh, all the cohorts with the box click, then we get a a, um, a dojo-wide sense of how many points per box clicked. My intuition, and we're going to see if this is true, this is one of the, actually one of the cool things about this program is we're getting a lot of data. So for example, the intuition I think of a lot of stronger players would be that the amount of work you do at a lower end, let's say at 800, if you put in an hour of work, that your rating gain from that hourly hour of work will be higher than if you did an hour of work at 2,400 plus. I think that's a common intuition. Anyways, we'll get a, we're gonna get a data set to see how true that is, right? Yeah, that's pretty, yeah, I'd be definitely interested in seeing how this evolves. And then, of, of course, uh, you know, a lot of it is, I mean, it's definitely evolved, but we just started in May, and a lot of it is, like, to get the data right, is my message to James Altucher. James Altucher needs to click the boxes, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's so big time, he, could, he probably has an assistant you could have click the boxes for him, right? <laughs> I could be his assistant, but <laughs> he, uh, I, one of the cool things about this, actually, is I'm not allowed to click his boxes. I don't have permission, so everybody here only has permission to edit their own line. Um, and the ratings get updated automatically. This is how tech amazing it is. Yeah, there's a lot of little tech details in here which are really cool that people have worked on. Um, yeah, all this stuff is... Like all, like chess.com, USCF, all that stuff? Everything's in there, yeah, and it gets updated daily. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, one thing too that actually will change in the presentation of your cohort is that instead of a thousand boxes for classical games, it's gonna look like this, where instead we're gonna get a progress bar. Um, and it's a little cleaner. And it also, it's nice because it just puts the classical games first, instead of it being, you know, at the end of all the list of things to do. Yeah, dude, oh, here's another thing that was interesting about the program. We didn't know at first about the like under 1,000. We didn't was like, well, will people show up? Is that something that you know people are gonna come and do? But if you check it out, we got loads, man. Look at this. Loads oh, of people. Great. And they're working, man. They are really working. And one thing originally we had that's interesting is we had originally this cohort was 800 to 1,000. But then we realized that 200 points was just too hard. It was too hard of a thing and that we needed to uh, break it up. So then we broke, you know, to six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, and nine to a thousand. Yeah. Cool. And this, By the way, just, yeah. I've, been, I've been 
with the adult improver pods, yeah, like Evan, who at least who has been in chat, like uh, uh, sometimes instead of having one guest, I have three talking about a specific rating barrier uh -huh. that right. they're trying to break through. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been I want to try to work on another one of those, and I want to do like a lower band. I'm thinking maybe like mm. twelve to fourteen hundred or something. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So. Um, so if anyone is uh, listening and is interested in coming on potentially and fits that criteria, just trying to get from roughly 1200 to 1400 I, I, the rating conversions make it also confusing these days, but right. my template would be basically chess.com slash USCF sure. ratings. Um, I would be interested in lining up a few people. And you can see here, here's our mm -hmm. list. We have our list of graduates. Oh, nice. Yeah, you know? that could be good, too. So these are the people that have gone up. And what's cool, too, is when you then look at them, you can see that they did substantially more work. Hmm, funny right? how that works. <laughs> funny yeah. how that works. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. What else? I, I'm so sure. can I drop oh. a link? I see uh, P. Mork is asking how we would get in touch. Am I... Can I put a link in chat? I assume so, or that? I could do it if, if, if it doesn't work for you. Okay, I'll try. Um, and then I want to show you one more thing. Great. This is awesome. I think you've got me convinced. I mean, one thing I have to say, though, Jesse, I'm a little worried because, like, you know, I'm working with a coach. Uh, Grandmaster Axel Bachman reviews all my games, uh -huh. and, like, he gives me targeted advice of things I need to work on. Yeah. So how would that be balanced with, like, the overall checking of boxes? Like, like for, I mean... My openings are decent. Like I said, he would be all in favor of me reviewing Tal Botvinnik. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, you know, everyone I'm interviewing, Alex Fishbein and Kaidanov, the interview that's out today, mm -hmm. um, they're talking about the benefits of solitaire chess, which also is, uh, you know, could be under the classical games reviewed right. thing. But like to the extent that you're doing something um, uh, independent but directed, is there a way to get like uh, credit for that? Um, like, because I like the measurability in the community and the cohort, but I'm not sure I would be studying like the exact things. All right, I'm gonna attempt to drop the link here. Yeah. Um, for it's, uh, oh, I have to log in. If it... You could send it to me too, like on, on the Zoom chat or something and I could post it. Why is it asking me for my birthday? Okay. I might, <laughs> Don't uh, ask it for your birthday. I'll give you I mean, birthday. I know I'm a Twitch noob, but geez, I do have an account. Um, <laughs> let's see. So I tell you what, while you're f figuring that out. Oh, wait, I, log in. Okay, I'll, I think this is going to... I'll try to answer the question. the question. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. Um, first of all, not everyone has a coach, right? It's great right. that you have a coach. And it's also great that the main thing you're doing is reviewing the games. I didn't say I was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I also know that you are making a concerted effort to play in tournaments and then to have yeah. those games to go over. And definitely, I, I, from what it sounds like anyway, you guys are uh, going over your games. And I think one of the first things this would do is it would give you the... Uh, like, forget about everything else. Just think about going over the games for a second, right? It would give you the inspiration, the need, the peer pressure to do a quality annotation of your game before even Axel looks at it. Right. Right? And then you can adjust those notes after he gives you feedback on, on what happened. I think that's a great process. And then, you know, you can do other things. I think you can even treat the program uh, a little bit lightly, especially because you're in a different spot where people are asking you all the time to like look at this and look at that and look at the other thing. Um, and I think as long as you focus on going over your games, that is going to be the main thing. Now, let me tell you a problem that you're in that a little bit I'm also in. Because you are getting bombarded with all kinds of different chess advice, you are not that different from the many of the people who have the reason for them coming to the program, which is there's so much chess advice out there that it can be overwhelming. And then what happens is you end up bouncing around from like doing this thing, doing that thing, never really sticking with a 
program, right? Yeah. And that can be really problematic. For myself, I am interested in uh, learning about all the other books in the program, for example. So, for example, I just read The Chess Tactics from Scratch, which you talked about on your podcast, because I wanted to know, and that's, I think, in the 15 to 1600 band. Uh, I wanted to know what it was, to see if it was a good book, you know, a little bit of my own personal growth, yada, yada. And that distracts me from the program itself. So me and you are in a compromised position. You'd think we were in, we'd be in a uh, privileged position, but we're actually in a compromised position because... Like, we can't put on blinders as easily as most chess players can, right? Yeah. Because I'm, like, helping curate this thing, so I have all this other information going on in my head. But for your case, I really want to stress, like, uh, I would say, if you were going to do it, right, come in here, focus on the classical games. I would say definitely do those made in twos. I'm sure Axel is fine with that. And then also focus then on uh, going over Tal Botvinnik, you know, Tal Botvinnik, yeah. 1960, one of the, the greatest book of all time. I think there's consensus, Ben. I think there's yeah. consensus. <laughs> and then, I mean, Kaidana was so bullish on solitaire, solitaire chess, which you can do as like either training mode or Lee Chess has a name for it. I can't remember what uh -huh. it is, where, where they hide the next move. Like, um, can I do it that way where I hide the move when I go over the games? Well, think about it. You have that Karpov database. Use that for your solitaire chess. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And I'm I think just going to DM you, Jesse. I give up on resetting my password <laughs> while I'm doing this live. I'm... That's fine. Buddy. That's fine. Uh, so there, I just DM you the link for anyone who fits the 1200 to 1400 band and might want to come on Perpetual Chess. Okay. Yeah. I'll post oh. that in the chat. And also, if you're generally interested in coming on as an adult improver, I just keep a running file so that if I'm ever looking for a certain demographic or a certain story, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, I gained 800 points in two weeks. Um, just it's more about the, uh, the story. Although if you did gain 800 points in two weeks, I kind of <laughs> like to hear about it. Yeah. Okay. Let's finish this up. I want to show you one more important thing. And that is our Discord server. So here we go. Um, so a lot going on in the Discord server. I'd say one minor weakness of the Dojo training program is there is a little bit of a learning curve. So for example, not everybody has fluency with Discord. I certainly didn't have fluency with Discord. When yeah, that was my initial, back when I interviewed Coaster, right when Dojo was launching. And yeah. I was like, Discord, flip that. And now <laughs> we've got this, we've got this running joke thing. It's not, it's more than a joke, but like, uh, <clears throat> it's hard. I'm an old guy, so it's hard for me to learn tech. And like DM Hokey, our tech guy, he's all wanting me to learn stuff. And so I only let him give me one thing, one bit of tech to learn per month. That's what I try to limit it to. You only, I can do one, some one thing a month. Anyways, so here's our Discord server. <clears throat> and one cool thing, actually, I, I'm just here at the question. So earlier this morning, I asked, uh, what should I show Ben, right? And then people are on it right away. I probably should have posted it last night, would have given more time. And so a bunch of people are writing in saying, oh, and that's how I got that um, Alakine versus Capablanca game review video to show you because somebody posted that. I wouldn't have even thought of it, right? So there's a lot of like institutional knowledge in this Discord server. And a lot of people, for example, show up into the dis different Discords and don't know what's going on and then people will help them out. Um, let me show you a couple things in here. A couple things I like. Achievements, this is one of my favorite things. Like when somebody graduates, we give them, an, you know, I give them a little oh, shout out cool. here. If you did come, all you would need to do is just do this getting started thing that DM Hokey set up. It'll probably take you a couple minutes. It's not that hard. And then the coolest thing is once you're in, you get assigned to your own cohort. So here we have the different cohorts, 0, 400, 4, 600, 7, 800, and so on. And then if you click on any of these, you know, there's this huge conversation that's going on um, at any different point. You can ask for advice. How do you do things? 
you can post that people will post their analyzed games here. Then there's the find training partner. And that's kind of like the key thing with the training partner, right? For uh, the opening work, the end game work, uh, you know, finding a classical game to play, all of that's going on uh, in, this, in these cohorts and in like channels like the find training partner. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share. We'll go back to your, your beautiful face and then we'll wrap it up with any final thoughts. So let's go back and... When should I do the big reveal that you've convinced me, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> well, we definitely would love to have you on. And I think a uh, cool thing, and not only would it be cool just because you, know, you have your perpetual pod and everything, but we are trying to really get more people in, let's say, the 2,000 and 2,100 plus cohorts because that's where we're a little soft still. So you being in there would be really great. Sounds good. Now, I'm a little, you know, you say getting set up like, so the um, intro page, it walks you through how to get the required info on the spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. So there's just like a minor learning curve depending on your age. For the millennials, they just, it's instant for them. Right. <laughs> for us, it takes a little bit more. But there's the scoreboard, and DM Hokey would set you up with just with your own line. Very simple then to fill it out. And then there's the Discord learning curve, where he's going to set you up at, with a rating band. And then, you know, you can use that rating band to set up games and yada yada. Um, and that's kind of it. I think those are the two main things you would need to kind of learn. And it shouldn't take more than 10 minutes, though for us, it might take more. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Even if it's 20, I'm okay with that. <laughs> if you cleaned your glasses too, Ben, I think your progress would be a lot better. <laughs> I know. I, want, I go through life this way. I have no idea why. <laughs> I remember when... We were, you were at the tournament a month or so ago. Your glasses were still that way too. So it's a. It's I don't know why, how they keep getting so dirty. Is this happen? Are you just cleaning your glasses all the time? You got to clean your glasses, buddy. That's you know oh, you man. see a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's wrap it up there, and um, we'll also do then in two days. We're going to record a podcast about reaching twenty two hundred. What Ben thinks he needs to reach twenty two hundred. What other people need to reach it and um, maybe also then he could give us some constructive criticism on what his cohort should look like in reaching to 2200 okay Sound, sounds good to me yeah i already have one thing in mind but we'll uh, we'll save it for the pod yeah all right sounds great guys we will catch you soon okay goodbye everyone